five decades ago, on March 7, 1971. The leader of the Awami League, Sheikh Mujibar Rahman, gave the call for the independence of Bangladesh, then known as East Pakistan. The proclamation led to a brutal crackdown by the Pakistani army on the people of Bangladesh. Around 3 million people were killed as Asia's new nation emerged into an uncertain future through mayhem and war. But 50 years after its birth, is the nation still haunted by its traumatic past? Has it fulfilled a part of Sheikh Mujibur's dreams of a democratic, peaceful and exploitation-free society called Shona Bangla or Golden Bengal? Or has the price of independence been too high for the country to bear? This National Martyrs Memorial, which stands proudly at the heart of the nation's capital, Dhaka, is a stark reminder of the blood-soaked birth of a populous nation five decades ago. The seven pairs of triangular walls represent seven defining chapters in the nation's history. The traumatic past is also etched on the marble slabs at Dhaka University that pay homage to the creme de la creme of Bangladesh society. The names include politicians, activists, professors, journalists, artists, doctors, intellectuals, students, and all those who dreamt of a modern, equal, and just society. They, however, did not live long enough to tell the tale, following one of the worst genocides the world had ever seen. But how and why did it happen? Nineteen forty seven, it marked the birth of two independent nations, Pakistan and India. Pakistan celebrated its independence on the fourteenth of August, nineteen forty seven, while India marked its independence day on the fifteenth of August. The new nation of Pakistan, however, was split into two enclaves, West Pakistan and East Pakistan. And soon, the struggle for power between the two political forces ripped the country apart. In 1970, a fierce contest was brewing between the Awami League and East Pakistan-based party led by Bangladesh's founding father, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and the Pakistan People's Party of Zulvika Ali Bhutto in the Western Enclave. Sheikh Mujibar Rahman, who was then campaigning for more autonomy for East Pakistan, won the general elections in Pakistan with an absolute majority of 161 seats, all of which were in East Pakistan. The Pakistan People's Party, on the other hand, 
secured only 81 seats, all of which were in West Pakistan. Bhutto, however, refused to form a government with the Awami League, led by Sheikh Mujibar Rahman. Protests then erupted across East Pakistan. In March, as the protests intensified, the military launched a brutal attack on civilians to stem the growth of nationalist sentiments there. And that triggered an all-out civil war. Millions were killed, and East Pakistan was forced to separate from the West. Oguruto tank ebong kamaner gola tank er gola tank egi ashlo rastay jeta amra barricade diyechhilam hajar hajar shrobik ebong amra chhatro jubokra shei sheguloke bhenge tara beriye gelo tosnos kore dilo ebong shei shomoy rastar dui pashe je dokan pat chilo tader karmochari der ke tara ei rater ondhokare hotta koreche bishwabidyalaye tara hotta koreche tara bari ghor akraman kore hotta koreche tara rajar bag akraman kore police line একবারেই প্রায় নিশ্চিহ্ন করে দিয়েছে এবং আমাদের ইপিআর ইস্ট পাকিস্তান রাইফেলের ওখানে আক্রমণ করে ইপিআরের ওখানে শত শত সৈনিককে মেরেছে পুলিশ শত শত পুলিশকে মেরেছে হাজার হাজার মানুষকে মেরেছে পঁচিশশো মার্চ রাতে ঢাকা শহরে সুতরাং তারপরে পাকিস্তানের সাথে আর কোনো রকম সমঝোতার সুযোগ আমাদের ছিল না the anticipated military action had cast a pall of gloom throughout the day over Dhaka University, the country's premier seat of learning. Professor Muni Razaman, a respected teacher in the university's statistics department, wrapped up his work early and returned home at the residential quarters on the campus. Muni Razaman's son, Zakaria Masud Abu Musa, can still recall the macabre events that took place that night as if it was only yesterday. Army the tinta group Eshe, Acta group Chilo, a commando group. Commando group Oche, Tara, Oche, Pura, Dhaka, Sahore, Kutaiki, Hobe, Kutai Hot Gona Hot Hobe, Kutai Akromon Hobe, Ed Kurache, Dituota Hotse, Akromon Kurache, Tituota Hotse, Amadis Discourse Moidane, Campe, Ura Opeka Kurache, Ebong. এই এই শিক্ষকদের বাসা কমান্ডো বাহিনী এসছে এবং খুব সম্মানের সাথে নিচে বলেছে যে প্রফেসর মনিরুজ্জামান আমার বাবার নাম মনিরুজ্জামান মনিরুজ্জামান গোঠাকুরতা এবং জিসি দেব আপনারা নেমে আসেন তিনবার বলেছে একবার উর্দুতে একবার ইংলিশে একবার বাংলায় বলার পরেই ওরা সোরা ও সোজা উপরে তিনতলায় চলে আসছে তিনতলায় এসে লাথি মেরে দরজা ভেঙে ফেলছে লাথি মেরে দরজা ভেঙে ভেঙে ফেলে বাসার ভিতরে গিয়ে আমার বাবাকে নিশ্চিত হয়েছে যে হ্যাঁ এনি মনিরুজ্জামান তখন তাকে টানতে টানতে নিয়ে নিচে নিয়ে যায় নিচে নিয়ে একতলা সিঁড়িতে গুলি করে হত্যা করেছে সাথে সাথে হত্যা করেছে আমার ভাই আমার চাচা আমার ফুফাতো ভাই এই তিনজনকে আবু মুসা ওয়াজ ড্র্যাগ ডাউন দ্য স্টেয়ার্স অ্যাজ ওয়েল হি ওয়াজ আস্ক টু আইডেন্টিফাই দ্য হাউস অফ প্রফেসর গুহা তাকুটা আর আমি বললাম যে গুহা ঠাকুরের ভাষা আমি জানি না কারণ যেখানে আমার বাবাকে মেরে ফেলছে আমার ভাইকে গুলি গুলি করেছে আমার চাচাকে মেরে ফেলেছে সেখানে ওদের কথা আর ওদের কথা বুঝতামও না ঠিক মতো উর্দুতে যখন বলেছে আমি জানি না তখন আমার পাঁজরের এখানে একটা বাড়ি মেরেছে বাড়ি মেরে তারা চলে যায় গিয়ে গু জিসি দেব জিসি দেবকে গুলি করে হত্যা করেছে It was December 1971. There was an air of expectancy and relief as Dr. Alim Chowdhury and his wife Shamoli walked out to the balcony of their modest home in Dhaka. They could see Indian fighters bombing Pakistani positions on the outskirts of the city. India was then providing support for the East Pakistan Liberation Movement as millions of refugees from East Pakistan crossed into India. But the horror that engulfed their home that evening tore apart the family forever, 
recalls Dr. Chowdhury's daughter, Professor Nuzad. It was on the 15th of December, 1971, a day before we won our victory, a day before surrender of the Pakistani army. It was in the evening. My parents were in the balcony watching the Indian MiGs bombard the pockets of Pakistani stronghold still there in Dhaka city. And my father was so happy. He's saying that, you know, Bangladesh is going to be free. Uh, those who do still think that uh, Pakistan is a reality are living in fool's paradise. He was saying that. And at that moment, a, a microbus came. It was laden with, in, with mud. It was, it was covered in mud. Um, and it stopped in our house. Just on ground floor, Al-Badr Maulana Mannan used to reside. These men, they were Bengalis, wearing a militia dress. They came in, went into his house. They stayed there for 45 minutes or so, and then they came up and knocked our door. And my mother asked my father, what do I do? He said, open the door. And they came in, asked my father's name. My, said, my father said his name. And then they said, you have to come with us. And as he was he, going down the stairs, they blindfolded him with a gamcha, you know, a piece of cloth, and was dragging him to the car. The next day, two young men turned up at the Chowdhury residence. They were looking for the men who had taken Dr. Alim away. They promised revenge. On the 16th of December, two Mukti Yodhas came to our home and they were saying, where's that criminal who killed Alim Bhai? So that's when my mother first heard that maybe my father was killed. You know, the tragedy of the whole thing is beyond belief. Professor Nuzad, who was in her infancy at the time of the killing, has followed her father's footsteps, becoming a renowned eye specialist in the country today. She is busy until late at night treating patients. But even 50 years after the gruesome tragedy, she can't come to terms with the fact that her father, a top eye surgeon and an intellectual, could be murdered in cold blood. They were the cream of the society. In all their professions, they were the best of the best. So they were well known, they were revered, they were respected. It is unthinkable that a doctor will be killed. What we heard from others later is that um, they, uh, all the intellectuals were taken to very close, to, close by Muhammad for Physical Training Institute, which is still there. They were kept there, tortured, and then in the morning, then in the morning they were brought here and then they were killed. Probably that's the same thing that happened to him. The mutilated body of Dr. Chowdhury, a former registrar at St. James Hospital in London, was found at a place that has been turned into a memorial in Dhaka. Where the black stone is maybe. But his body was recognizable because he was picked up late on the 15th of December. So it was clearly recognizable, although mutilated. And then we took him from here to our home. As the killings intensified, so did the liberation struggle. Tens of thousands were slaughtered across the nation as the freedom movement gained momentum. About 10 million people fled to neighboring India as refugees. The brutal military onslaught gave people a steely resolve. Not just the resistant fighters, but the entire society was unified in the struggle to gain independence. Sohagpur village, 
around 150 kilometers from the Bangladeshi capital, Dhaka. It's called the village of widows. It was here that one of the most brutal and horrific massacres was committed against innocent civilians during the liberation war against Pakistan. On July 25, 1971, young Zubaida Bewa was busy with the household work. She had no inkling of a gruesome fate awaiting the peaceful village. Suddenly, she heard a loud burst of gunfire from a nearby field, and her husband stumbled in. The attackers hunted down every man in the village and shot them dead. 187 men were killed in the village in a few hours, turning married women into widows. <laughs> With all the men dead, there was a silence of the graves. Zubaida was clinging on to her children, somehow trying to survive. But she did not know her nightmare hadn't ended with the killings. A few days later, the men came back and raped Zubaida and the other women in the village. <laughs> Justice finally prevailed in 2015 when the Bangladesh Supreme Court sentenced Muhammad Kamar Rosman to death for his role in the massacre of unarmed civilians and the rape of women in the village. He was hanged. Zubaida now feels a certain sense of closure.
গেছিলাম ঠিকই থাকে দিছি না হ্যাঁ নাম আছে খুশি তো খুশি কাদের ডাক্তার আসিন লগে কাদের ডাক্তার তো মারাই গেল আমরা আমি দেখছি কাদের ডাক্তার লগে আসি বেহারি গেল লগে এটাই জানি কিন্তু আমি কামাল জামালটা দেখছি না কোন হো আবার ভাই কিন্তু দেখছি না বলে কারো এটা খারাই করে আঙ্গরিয়া দূরে অন্ধকার আমরা এই দোষ হয়ে হারাই না In the busy capital of Dhaka, 70-year-old Nasiruddin Yusuf Bachu spends most of his time with young people who need his guidance and advice. An award-winning filmmaker and a national cultural icon, Nasiruddin Yusuf has spent years training young actors and directors to sharpen their creative skills. But his ever-flowing creativity had found a unique expression 50 years ago. The struggle to establish a Bengali identity and the horrific atrocities on civilians had forced Nasiruddin Yusuf to become a guerrilla fighter on the streets. I was told that my Bangla language, 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 my দেশে স্বাধীনতার কথা ভেবেছি যুদ্ধটা কিন্তু আমাদের পর চাপিয়ে দেয়া হয়েছে এবং 25 মার্চ হঠাৎ করে বঙ্গবন্ধু শেখ মুজিবুর রহমানের সাথে আলোচনা সমাপন না করে পাকিস্তানি মিলিটারি জান্তা এই হত্যাकांड অপারেশন সার্চলাইট শুরু করে আমি ঢাকার রাস্তায় স্ট্রিট ফাইটে প্রথমে ছিলাম কিন্তু পাকিস্তানের ফায়ার পাওয়ারের কাছে আমরা নিরস্ত্র লোক আমাদের হাতে লাঠি ছোটা এসব ছিল কিন্তু যে মুহূর্তে আমরা অস্ত্র হাতে ভারত থেকে অস্ত্র পেলাম প্রশিক্ষণ পেলাম আমাদের সেনাবাহিনী আমাদের পুলিশ আমাদের ইপিআর সদস্যরা আমাদের সাথে এসে যোগ দিল তখন থেকে কিন্তু আমরা লড়াইটা শুরু করলাম Despite the heavy odds of taking on a professional army Nasiruddin Yusuf who headed a guerrilla unit of resistant fighters was undeterred They wanted freedom and a country based on language and not on religion সকল মানুষের সম অধিকার চেয়েছে সকল জাতিসত্তার সম অধিকার চেয়েছে আর হচ্ছে হিন্দু মুসলিম বৌদ্ধ খ্রিস্টান ভাগ থাকবে না পাকিস্তান যেমন ইসলামিক রাষ্ট্র আমরা একটি ভাষাভিত্তিক জাতিসত্তার রাষ্ট্র চেয়েছি এই এই একটা ন্যাশনালিজম আছে কিন্তু সেটা রিলিজিয়াস ন্যাশনালিজম না ধর্ম নয় ধর্ম ভাগ করে He was young and took significant risks, but he never thought he could die in the war of independence. যে গ্রুপটা ছিল সেই গ্রুপটা ঢাকা উত্তর মুক্তি বাহিনী নাম অনেকে ক্র্যাক প্লাটুন বলে আর কি মানে সব মিলেই ক্র্যাক প্লাটুন হচ্ছে ঢাকা অপারেশন যারা ছিল তাদের সবাইকে বলা হতো কিন্তু আমাদের এটা স্পেসিফিকলি ঢাকা উত্তর মুক্তি বাহিনী এই মুক্তি বাহিনীর বেশ কিছু আরবান গেরিলা ওয়ারফেয়ার করতে হয়েছে আমাদের কয়েকটি তার মধ্যে উল্লেখযোগ্য হচ্ছে প্রথমত বলবো বাইতুল মোকারম মার্কেটের যে অপারেশনটা আরেকটি হচ্ছে যে পাকিস্তান টেলিভিশনের ডিআইটি অপারেশন আরেকটি হচ্ছে ঢাকা বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ে কলাভবন অপারেশন আরেকটি হচ্ছে মালিবাগ রেল গেট অপারেশন রেল লাইনের ওখানে অপারেশন আরেকটি হচ্ছে কাকরাল মোড়ে যে ইয়ে আছে সে অপারেশন তাছাড়া ঢাকার বাইরে ব্রিজ অপারেশন আছে না আমার হয়েছে কি আমার ঠিক ওরকম কখনো মনে হয়নি যে আমি মারা যেতে পারি এটা অদ্ভুত একটা ঘটনা আমার মনে হয়নি Today's Bangladesh faces a host of challenges ranging from poverty and climate change to Islamic fundamentalism. How will it deal with the myriad issues as it shakes off its troubled past?
50 years may not be a long time in a nation's history, especially if it's saddled with extreme poverty and backwardness. But even in this brief span, Bangladesh has made dramatic strides forward. Over the last two decades, it has reduced poverty by half. And in the last decade and a half, it lifted over 25 million out of poverty, says the World Bank. Enhanced human capital, lower fertility rates, and increased life expectancy have also accompanied poverty reduction. Over the last 10 years, I should say, there has been an acceleration in the GDP growth rate. In the 1980s, the GDP growth rate was average annual was 3.8% only. That was a lost decade, uh, stamps, uh, termed by, by, by many. Then in the 1990s, it was 4.9% average annual. And from 2000 to 2009, it was 5.8% on average. But after 2010, it was over 6% every year up to 2015, fiscal 14-15. Then the next three years, it's over 7%. Then next, next year, 18-19, it was 8.2%. So th there is an acceleration. But its fundamental challenge of eradicating poverty and backwardness in the country is far from over. Though there has been some progress in poverty reduction, it has not been uniform across the country. In fact, some areas, poverty reduction has stagnated and even increased. About one in four still live in poverty, while almost half of those live in extreme poverty and cannot pay for their basic needs. Experts agree that as the country becomes more urbanized, income disparity has also increased. The disparity has increased, but it could have increased much more. For example, in India, the latest figure that I have is 0.51, the Gini coefficient, and ours is 0.48 now. From it was in 10, 2010, it was 0.45, so it has increased. It could have been much worse. Despite the marginal change in disparity numbers, life has not changed for many living on society's margins. Not far away from Dhaka, in the Matbo village in Manikganj district, 45-year-old Asma Begum has seen no change in her fortunes for decades. She got married at 18 and has been struggling to feed herself and her family. Her husband is a daily wage earner whose meagre earnings are hardly enough to keep starvation at bay. The eldest daughter is married, but all of them go hungry from time to time. Asma's husband, who's physically challenged, cannot support the family properly. Asma didn't go to school. Neither could she afford education for her children as well. Her son has dropped out of school and does odd jobs for little pay. Asma manages her precarious existence on the banks of the Jamuna River. She knows her ramshackle hutman is likely to be washed away when the rains come. She will then have to move to another village. <laughs> 
like Asma, Najma Begum on the outskirts of Dhaka leads a hand-to-mouth existence. She has four sons. She sent two of them to a madrasa where they can live and study for free. Najma's husband died of tuberculosis six months ago. <laughs> Najma continues her precarious existence, relying on local help. Yet, she says, she has received no government help. She has lived with hunger and poverty for years. Apart from poverty, another major challenge the young nation faces is radicalization. In recent years, fundamentalists have carried out attacks against people who they believe threaten their extremist worldview. In July 2016, 22 people were killed when gunmen stormed the Holy Artisan Bakery in the capital. The cafe was popular with expatriates and locals, and many of those who were killed were foreigners. Just a few months before the cafe massacre, secular publisher Faisal Arifin Dipon was going through a manuscript in his office in the center of Dhaka one afternoon. It was a busy day in late October 2015, with several important meetings lined up for the 43-year-old publisher. A group of armed men barged into his office and hacked Dipon to death. Development Studies Department Professor Tar Bashai. বসেছিলাম আমি দিপন আমার সঙ্গে ছিল এই সকাল 8:30 টার দিক থেকে ডাক্তার পর্যন্ত অনেক কথা বলতে আমরা বলছি আলোচনা করছি নানান বিষয় তারপরে খাবার রেডি করছে তখন দিপন আমি খাবো না আমার একটু যেতে হবে জরুরি দরকার একটা টেলিফোন কে করছে তো দিপন উঠে গেল আমি নিষেধ করলাম ওর বোন নিষেধ করলো কিন্তু কোনো কথা শুনলো না চলে গেল Professor Huck went looking for Deepon later in the afternoon since he had some work with him. The front door of Deepon's house was locked, but Huck could see lights inside. He rang the doorbell, but no one opened the door. He called Deepon's wife, who had gone to a neighbor's house. Deepon is three. এই যে কথা আমাকে বললো সেটা যে আমাকে টেলিফোন করে জানিয়েছে যে ওই যে টুটুল আর কে কি নাম আছে বই প্রকাশ করে তারাও তাদেরকে আক্রমণ করছিল এবং তারা মেডিকেল কলেজ হসপিটালে আছে দীপনকেও আক্রমণ করে থাকতে পারে তারা এরকম বলল তো গাড়ি নিয়ে গেছিলাম আমি গাড়িতে দীপনের স্ত্রী এবং আমি আসলাম এখানে এসে একটা বইয়ের দোকান পেপিরাস নাম সেটার যে মালিক মোশারফ সে আমাকে বলল যে স্যার দীপন আর নাই ঢুকেই দেখি দীপন পড়ে আছে এবং গোটা ঘরটাই ফ্লোরের মধ্যে তার গায়ে রক্ত আমরা ভাবি নাই যে দীপনে বই প্রকাশ করেছে এই জন্য দীপনকে মারবে ইউনিক ঘটনা দেখা যায় না পৃথিবীর কোনো দেশে in February, eight extremists convicted for killing Deepon were sentenced to death. The government has adopted strict measures to deal with the extremist menace. Hundreds of people have been jailed and scores have been killed in the crackdown by security forces.
But for the man who lost his young son, revenge was never on his mind. I was a very proud of him. He was a very proud of him. এই মৃত্যুর জন্য দায়ী যারা হত্যাকারী তারা সেই রাজনীতির কারণে সেই সংস্কৃতির কারণে তাদের উত্থান ঘটেছে তবে দেশে আইনের শাসন বজায় রাখার জন্য প্রতিষ্ঠা করার জন্য বিচারের দরকার আছে এবং সেটা সরকার করবে বিগতভাবে মনে করি যারা এই রাজনীতি এবং এই সংস্কৃতি করছে দেশে তারাই এর জন্য দায়ী and we see that rise of new extremism which was not in bangladesh in 71 or uh, before it's mostly a Sunni, a liberal Islam, which has found its root here, and that has been reflected in the culture and tradition of Bengal. So we feel that we have the strength in our history, in our society, in our culture, but there are challenges which is emerging. But I am confident that Bangladesh, with its identity, with its secular philosophy, with its national cultural identity, will be able to face this. It is not only a, a surveillance problem or police problem, it is also an ideological and cultural problem. And here Bangladesh has an added strength. The populist nation's strength is being tested on multiple fronts. Apart from abject poverty and radicalization, periodic floods, cyclones and river erosion cause incalculable suffering every year. Still, Bangladesh is marching ahead. It's now one of the fastest growing economies globally, with a young population determined to leave its traumatic past behind. Is it on course to become a modern, secular democracy? Or has the price of freedom become too high for the nation to cope with for many more years to come? the unbounded joy of freedom with my fellow countrymen who have owned their freedom in an epic liberation struggle. The ultimate achievement of this struggle is the creation of an independent, sovereign People's Republic of Bangladesh, of which my people declared me as the president while I was a, I was a prisoner in the condemned cell awaiting the execution of a sentence of hanging. No people has met, has had to pay as high a price in human life and suffering for the freedom that has been exerted from the people of Bangladesh. Five decades ago, the country was born amid genocide, squalor and starvation. And four years after its birth, its founding father Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and his family were slaughtered in a military coup in Dhaka. With political turmoil and widespread poverty, the country's reputation was sealed as a basket case and its future was considered hopeless. But today, the nation has emerged as one of the fastest growing economies in the world. The research organization in the UK, Center for Economic and Business Research, they have uh, found in their report 2020, Global League Table, they call it, Bangladesh would become 25th largest in 2035. So, and then, uh, the, then there are other, other predictions. But that's the economic growth and uh, size of the economy. Yes, it is growing and it will grow, it will continue to grow. We have been able to manage the uh, COVID-19 much better than many other countries. Our recovery has started and although there are, there are problems, but, um, but I think we have done much better. One person who represents the new Bangladesh is a 50-year-old computer scientist turned entrepreneur, Siobhan Islam, the son of a Liberation War veteran. Siobhan did a master's in computer science in the US and completed management studies at Stanford. 
He then kept a promise he had made to his father that he would return to his homeland and work for his country. He now heads a 300 million US dollar garments manufacturing group that supplies to top labels in the United States and Europe. I worked for Microsoft in Hewlett Packard for 20 years and uh, when my father passed away, uh, before his death, I promised him that I will return. Uh, his plea to me was, what will happen to my people? So most of the people that works in our company originally came from our village, Shahjat Pushirajgan. So that kind of stick to me. I was very successful in America and I would give a word to my father that I will come back. So I returned home and uh, I started working and grew this company that he built. In the last 15 years or so, Siobhan has grown his business almost 20 times, from a 20 million US dollar unit to a 300 million US dollar company at present. His products are marketed by some of the top fashion brands in the world. Our main export is basically divided between the two countries. We export in European Union as well as in America. Predominantly when we first started, we were, our export was maybe 70% to US and about 40% to uh, European Union, mostly UK. But right now it's 50-50. We are uh, one of the largest sup suppliers for Marks & Spencer, uh, who is basically predominantly a British company, as you know, and American global brand called Gap, Gap Inc., as well as Ann Taylor Talbert's. Those are our top brand for USA. So we manufacture for these top brands in USA. Originally, our product was 100% cotton-based product. We used to manufacture mostly bottoms and shirts. Bottoms and shirts. Bottoms was predominantly our main business. And then cotton casual shirts. These are the two categories that we used to produce. But for last four years, we have been very much diversified our product sets. We are about 50-50 cotton and uh, synthetic fabrics-based product. The country's garments industry is today the second largest globally after China. It has been one of the primary engines of growth in the nation of 164 million people. The industry earns more than $35 billion a year from exports and employs 4 million people, a large majority of whom are women. The country has also left behind Pakistan in many UN development and growth indices. Its growth rate in 2018 was 7.8%, well above that of Pakistan's 5.8%. This year, it's projected to grow at 6.8%, according to the Asian Development Bank. In IMF's latest economic outlook, Bangladesh has also overtaken India in projected per capita GDP. We have left behind Pakistan in many respects. Uh, India, we have caught up with them. I wouldn't say that we have, uh, we have uh, done better in terms of GDP. It's one year we have, uh, but next year uh, it may not be, we don't know. But at least we have caught up. We have caught up with them. We are much behind now. We are at par with them on per capita GDP, which is very good. And in many other respects, for example, as I said earlier, the women's, uh, women's empowerment and, uh, and social indicators, we are ahead of them. So I think we are, we are doing fairly well. A proud nation has made its presence known. It's no longer a basket case for sure. But the dreams of its independence leaders haven't yet been fulfilled. Millions live in poverty. Unemployment is around 6% and illiteracy and disease are rampant. Najma Begum, for one, doesn't think she has any future at all. She fears she will die the way her husband died if the government doesn't lend a helping hand. Bangladesh is also severely impacted by the growing effects of climate change. 
a third of its population is at risk of displacement from rising sea levels. Other challenges are emerging as well, such as radicalization, forcing the government to crack down hard on fundamentalism. Still, there's much hope and expectation since the country has shown resilience and strength to tide over insurmountable odds. The government is now looking ahead, setting ambitious targets, including elevating Bangladesh to a higher middle-income country, 10 years, and the developed one by 2041. Can it be done? If it is achieved, the heavy price of freedom won't certainly go in vain. যে কারণে 30 লক্ষ মানুষ মারা গেছে তা সম্পূর্ণ সফল এখনো বাংলাদেশ হয়নি কিন্তু বাংলাদেশ বাঙালি একটি আত্মপরিচয় দিতে পারে বাঙালি হিসাবে বাংলাদেশের নাগরিক হিসাবে তার একটি স্বাধীন রাষ্ট্র হিসাবে এবং সেই স্বাধীন রাষ্ট্রটা সে নিজে পরিচালনা করতে পারে বাংলা ভাষায় পরিচালিত হচ্ছে এইজন্য আমরা কিছুটা গৌরব করতে পারি সম্পূর্ণভাবে নয় পিপল হ্যাভ পেইড এ হাই প্রাইস বাট দে they have defended a philosophy and ideology which is worth to defend. So it is for humanity's sake that Bangladesh suffered greatly and also humanity extended their cooperation for the struggle of Bangladesh. It was absolutely worth it. We will not trade anything for it. Liberation is our strength. We are a homogeneous country. Our people, our freedom is our strength. With a lot of aspiration, enthusiasm and dream, Bangladesh will go to new heights, I am sure. Independence is worth it. This flag is worth it. This country is worth it. This passport is worth it. This pride is worth it. No price is big enough for freedom. We play, paid for our freedom with our own blood. And we are so proud of it. I'm so proud of the fact that my father was that brave man who gave up, gave up his life for the independence of my country.